In this video, I'll be talking about how I made Hazel considerably faster. And I'm not just talking about in some kind of isolated stress test, but in an actual game, like in our latest shipped game, Dichotomy. Which, by the way, you can download and play for free. And Hazel? What's Hazel? Hazel is my game engine. Check it out if you want. I'm gonna talk a little about why it was slow in the first place and take you through some history, so buckle up. There were lots of little things here and there, of course, but the main character was the renderer. Like, the entire renderer basically needed to be rewritten, and this was something I knew from pretty much the beginning. I'm gonna try and keep this like not too technical and give you kind of the high level picture, but if you are interested in the technical details, then I've actually started this new thing on Patreon for the $5 tier, where I'm kind of posting like these long form technical videos where I just like hit record and explain how things work without having to like fit them into the format of a YouTube video or anything like that. So if you want more details, just check that out. So initially Hazel used OpenGL for rendering in the very beginning. And then as time went on, we added Vulkan as an API. And I say added because there was a time when Hazel supported both OpenGL and Vulkan. You could basically pick your render API at runtime and the results were pretty much identical. Like as in visually, you'd get the same set of features. Now, as time went on and more and more kind of OpenGL devices were like dropping off, Vulkan was obviously getting popularity, hardware was progressing. It made really no sense to keep OpenGL around, especially because we had no intention of like supporting mobile devices. Our primary kind of target here is like desktop hardware at the moment and possibly console hardware in the future. And because of the way that Vulkan is, to really like take advantage of all of the extra performance potential that Vulkan like offers and why it was really introduced in the first place, you kind of have to architect your entire application to be like in that kind of form. Like for example, Vulkan supports multi-threading on like a, a huge scale. Whereas with OpenGL, you can really just like spin off a render thread if you want. And usually that's the best move, of course. And then kind of have this just like two threaded system where you have like a main thread and a render thread that does like the OpenGL API commands. And that's kind of it. Like you can't have like an extra resource loading thread that has to be incorporated into the render thread somehow. Vulkan also allows you to have like many frames in flight, usually two or three. That just means that you can get on with like the CPU part of like rendering, meaning submitting commands to the GPU and like building up these command buffers, command lists while the GPU is actually doing its rendering. Because of course the GPU and the CPU are two different devices. So Vulkan really just lets you take advantage of that. But if you want to take advantage of that, your engine has to be architected in a way that does take advantage of that. And if you want to support OpenGL and Vulkan, simultaneously, you either need almost two different engines, not just two different renderers really, but two different engines basically, or you just cut OpenGL out, which is what we decided to do because for the reasons I've described, as well as being a small team with not many resources, it doesn't make sense for us to support OpenGL. So long story short, because we did support both of them, there, there's a lot written kind of in a way that has to support OpenGL that I never really got around to rewriting. And because of that, the CPU usage on particularly the render thread, was extremely high in Hazel, and it really did not scale well at all. And there were lots of little reasons as to why it was slow, but really at the end of the day, it came down to one big reason. And it's crazy how like this one huge chunk of the puzzle just ended up like affecting so much and like the performance improvement we've seen from it has like just been absolutely brilliant. And that was the way that we were handling these things called descriptor sets in Vulkan. You know what else is brilliant? The fact that this video is sponsored by Brilliant.org. Those of you who don't know what Brilliant.org is, it's an amazing website filled with lots and lots of great courses on various STEM topics. Me personally, I love Brilliant for its math courses. It starts all the way in the beginning with the everyday math course, which is fantastic if you've always been kind of scared of math and you just don't know how to start, it's so confusing to you. Or if you're struggling with the more advanced topics, you know, like calculus, for example, Brilliant can really, really help you there because Brilliant's courses are extremely engaging and interactive. They present these complex topics visually. They let you play with the actual numbers and see the results visually using these widgets. The lessons are organized into like really nice kind of bite-sized chunks and they'll quiz you to engage you and to make sure that you're actually retaining this information. Brilliant have a 30-day free trial that you can check out to see what they offer for yourselves. And if you do go on to like it, then Brilliant have been nice enough to offer the first 200 subscribers 20% off an annual membership. Just go to brilliant.org slash the channel. Link will be in the description below. Huge thank you as always to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. By the way, check out this thing Discord sent me. What do I do with this?
Now, as I mentioned, I don't want to get too deep here on a technical level, but I'll try my best to kind of summarize this so that it made kind of makes sense. Basically, there are these things called resources. Is that too deep? When you write code that you're going to execute on your GPU, such as like in the form of a render pass or a compute shader, you'll probably need to use things like buffers or textures. And so when you write your shader, you have the ability to kind of take in inputs of resources you want to use, such as buffers or textures, and you can also kind of output to those resources as well. Really, if we boil this down, it's kind of like, I just want to use this memory. Like I'd like to read from or write to that memory. And the way that shaders are written, these are kind of expressed as just like binding points, meaning like I want to use this texture and it's going to be at binding point two. It's kind of like an ID that lets you address that particular resource that's going to be bound in that pipeline. Now, fundamentally, the way that this works is actually kind of similar in OpenGL and in Vulkan, but in OpenGL, everything was kind of reactive, meaning that like right before you issue a draw call or like a compute shader dispatch, you can just be like, hey, I'm binding this texture to slot two. And that's that. Now in Vulkan, it almost works the same way. It's just that there's this new type of resource that is used to describe resources themselves, and that's called a descriptor. And these descriptors are organized into different descriptor sets. And so the idea is you have like this little like piece of memory on the GPU itself that kind of contains like almost a description, if you want to call it that, of a resource that you can then bind to a particular binding point. And the idea is because that's kind of fundamentally stored in VRAM, that kind of descriptor, you can create these like sets of descriptors up front and then kind of bind them in bulk before you do any kind of like rendering or compute work. And another major advantage is because there's like more than one descriptor set, meaning like a group of descriptors, you can actually organize these based on like frequency of change and not really frequency of change. Like, you know, I need to update my camera buffer every frame, but more like I need to bind a completely different resource. And so you can get a bit more deep into this. Like you could, for example, have different descriptor sets for like per draw like resources such as like this is my material with all my like you know PBR inputs like my albedo map my normal map metalness roughness textures all that kind of stuff versus things like the camera buffer which are kind of global like probably for the whole frame even not just for that render pass but anyway all of that aside the point is there's lots you can do in Vulkan that you can't do in OpenGL but we were still living in the OpenGL days because we supported OpenGL as well and we started with OpenGL so now that OpenGL was gone we just had Vulkan kind of playing that part of the rendering game like OpenGL did. And that is basically what this new renderer changed. It basically rewrote the whole like renderer resource management system. I created these things called render passes, which inside Hazel, it kind of lets you take in a set of inputs and produces a set of output resources, which you can then bind, like you can take outputs from some render passes, bind them to inputs of different render passes, and so you basically create something called a render graph. Now, currently, I wouldn't say we're quite at the stage of it actually being organized into a graph, which can be really useful because you can automatically like handle dependencies between passes, such as like a shadow map pass outputting a depth buffer that needs to be used as an input in like your normal kind of geometry pass. But it's on the way to that. And even without it being organized into a graph per se, it's still a huge benefit because it lets us kind of declare statically kind of all of our render passes and compute passes wire in all of the inputs and the outputs. And we do that like upfront. It's kind of like we declare that the scene renderer that needs to render the scene, this is like the complete list of render passes, all the inputs that are needed for each render pass, all of the outputs that plug into like other render pass inputs. And that's kind of it. It's all like done up front and if stuff does change which can happen so if you like resize the window for example it has to recreate a whole bunch of stuff not just like the main frame buffers for every single pass pretty much but also like some like storage buffers need to be resized like for light culling for example because the number of tiles on the screen may have changed there's lots of like little things that need to change and since you're recreating those resources like images and buffers those descriptors have to be updated but hazel handles all that automatically when it's needed it's also further complicated by the fact that there are multiple frames in flight, meaning that like for a lot of these like uniform buffers, like there may need to be more than one of them and you need to make sure that you use the correct one based on the frame index. So like on a typical Nvidia GPU, there are three frames in flight, which means we basically need three copies of that of those buffers. Then you also have materials which might get updated, but you can't update descriptor sets that are currently being used on the GPU for rendering right now 
because the CPU and the GPU are running kind of concurrently, which means if the GPU is using that descriptor set, you can't update it from the CPU. So suddenly you need you need to have several like descriptor sets kind of per frame in flight so that you can safely update them and then you just bind the one for that frame index before you render. So there are lots of nuances which I will discuss in that in-depth video on my Patreon. And that's also a really good place to kind of ask questions and I'll probably end up making follow-up videos to that if people are interested. But basically that's kind of like how the new system works. I'll just show some code on screen as well just to give you an example of like what it means to like declare like a render pass and define a render pass I guess up front and yeah that kind of stuff just happens on like the creation of the scene renderer so basically like on startup and then we're able to like validate that render pass to make sure that all the inputs have been satisfied and then we're able to bake that render pass which basically just means it will allocate the descriptor sets from the descriptor pool and actually like tie the the resources into those descriptor sets so that they can be used now to quickly contrast this to how it was done before there was basically like kind of one descriptor pool i guess per frame in flight globally we reset it at the start of every frame and we just allocated descriptor sets from scratch every single frame and then updated those descriptor sets to bind the resources. And because there was only one set, because OpenGL only supports one set, right? So there was only like set equals zero, like that's all you had. Everything was in that one set. It meant that every single draw call, when you wanted to draw something with a material, it basically had to allocate a descriptor set and then every single input into that shader, like everything from per draw stuff, like the albedo texture, for example, to like the camera buffer and like, you know, the light storage buffers and all of that stuff, those descriptors had to be set up from scratch every single frame. So even though like allocating descriptor sets from a pool is not like the slowest thing, it's not that bad when you do have it for like per draw, basically for like an entire 3D scene and there are several render passes. It's just like, it's, it really is quite a bit of CPU overhead. So that's kind of just gone now, which is amazing. And to show you kind of the performance improvement that we've seen, I want to introduce you to a uh, new member of the Studio Chono family. Is this a weird shot? Right, so I want to introduce you guys to the newest member of the Studio Chono family. We have this beautiful pre-built computer. Actually, you know what? You can share this special moment with me. So this is the Studio Cherno QA PC. This is like the Steam Hardware Survey computer. Like I went on Steam Hardware Survey, the latest one, March 2023, and I basically like got a computer that had the exact specs. So an Intel six core CPU, I don't even know which one this actually is, I'll put it on the screen. 16 gigabytes of RAM, an RTX 3060, which I think it used to be a 1650, was like the number one GPU by far. But now somehow in March 2023, it's changed the RTX 3060. So that's what's in here. And the idea is we have like kind of like the most popular configuration, like just your stock standard average PC as far as Steam goes. And that's gonna basically be used for just like testing Hazel, like both just making sure that it builds and every commit builds on like all the available platforms. And also that like performance is kind of stable or getting better. So the idea is eventually to run automated tests on this computer so that like every commit obviously doesn't have to be manually checked. And this fella over here will be the computer doing that testing. All right, so here we are on the QA machine. Really need a name for this computer. Poppy. We're gonna call her Poppy. So here we have Poppy. As you can see, it's an absolutely fresh install. Like I, I haven't even bothered to install any other browser. We're just Microsoft edging. Um, and I've got two versions of Dichotomy here. We've got the new renderer version and the old version. Let's uh, rearrange them. So let's take a look at the old version. Now this is basically like the the, the version that we shipped. This Like this version that's on itch.io, which by the way, you guys can download like for free and you know, play our game. It's basically the same. There are a few modifications, just like some extra key commands that do some stuff, which we'll find out in a minute. Uh, if we go into here and just launch dichotomy. By the way, since we'll be mostly focusing on the CPU usage, I have this little app here called Sizer, which is pretty cool. It basically lets you resize like the last selected window to whatever resolution you want, such as 640 by 480. And the reason why I'm doing this is because we wanna basically exclude like GPU usage from this. Obviously the more pixels you have, like the more processing the GPU will have to do. And even though the GPU will be the one doing that work, the CPU might have to wait 
for the GPU to finish before it can progress, which will affect like the total kind of frame time. Anyway, if we just uh, hit enter to play, Control F3, even on the retail kind of version, the shipped copy brings up these stats. And you can see that we have like, you know, I mean, straight away you can kind of look at the render thread and see that it's spending about three milliseconds. Now keep in mind this like dodgy looking GPU timer, which sometimes goes to zero for some reason in this version, that is also taking up like a bit of time. If I make this even smaller, it's a little bit hard to see now, but you can see the GPU time is a lot kind of faster and the render thread time, which potentially includes waiting for the GPU as well, is also kind of smaller, but you can still see it's like around two milliseconds, sometimes spiking up to three or so. And we've really reduced the GPU time from this as well. Now, what I've done is I've made F2 spawn these kind of dead bodies. Uh, and the reason why is just because I wanna increase the like amount of objects that we have to process. now. You can see the render thread has increased quite a bit, even though the GPU time is still kind of constant because we're not really increasing much GPU usage here, but we are, as you can see, increasing the render thread usage. If I just take a screenshot of that and go into paint. All right, so here we have a screenshot. If we talk about this a little bit, let me explain some of these numbers in a bit more detail. So the most important part is probably this, like these bottom two timers, because these are the kind of overall frame times. This is like the overall time spent by the GPU, like for that frame. And then this is the kind of complete frame time. So you could look at it as the CPU frame time because that's what it is, but it that does potentially also include if we have to wait for the GPU to finish its kind of processing, because obviously we can't necessarily continue on with the next CPU frame if the GPU is too far behind, we have to wait for it to catch up. So 3.34 milliseconds is what also contributes, you can see to this frame rate. Now you can see though, that if we look at the distribution of work, there are two different threads. We have the main thread, which is 1.75 milliseconds. This this includes things like script update and physics as well, the physics simulation, as well as, you know, just like, well, the whole entire logic for the game and everything the engine has to do, including render thread submission commands. So basically what I mean by that is the main thread tells the render thread what to do by queuing up work onto a render command queue. And then when the main thread has finished its frame, it kicks off the render thread. So it starts going through that queue while simultaneously at the same time, the main thread is building up the next frames render command queue. So it's kind of like a double buffered queue. The fact that these are two different threads is obviously really good for performance because it means that instead of the frame time being like the sum of 1.75 and 3.3, it's 3.34. It's basically like whatever takes longer, which is this guy, since they're running at the same time, this isn't like added together and therefore like five milliseconds is our frame time. It's 3.3, which is great. However, you can also see that uh, these like time timers are, it's hard to get an exact reading because they're kind of almost referencing different frames, but you can see that the GPU time is around two milliseconds, 2.25 milliseconds. The render thread time is a whole millisecond more than that. And to make matters worse, it's kind of difficult to see in this version of Hazel, well, with the timers that I've exposed here, how much of this time is actually pure kind of CPU usage. Because what it could be is it could have finished its work in about one millisecond and it could be waiting 2.25 milliseconds for the GPU to finish the frame because the GPU is too far behind. So technically speaking, this could be as low as one millisecond of actual work, but let me just cheat a little bit and tell you that it's not. It's about three milliseconds of actual work. And maybe I'll share some like more specific examples with you because Tim has been working on designing QA tests specifically to stress test different parts of the engine so that we can really kind of show this new renderer just massively improving the CPU usage. But on the other hand, like stress tests are, are good in a way, but also I feel like real world examples are probably better, which is why I'm showing you like an actual game rather than like, you know, here's a million objects. Here's a stress test that's probably not never gonna happen in the real world. I think both. Both are necessary. So anyway, my point is that the render thread here is taking around three milliseconds. We're just gonna take that at face value, three milliseconds. Let's uh, close this and let's take a look at the new renderer version of Dichotomy. So I have actually a few different binaries here. I've built one with screen space reflections off. I think they're on in this version. It's kind of hard to tell. Uh, just because that's going to reduce the GPU usage. And even though that is technically a configuration setting that you can set outside of recompiling the binary, I've recompiled the binary. Uh, and then we have a more timers version, um, which is actually the one that I'm going to run. This was something that I just realized, it, why not add more timers so that we can see a few more kind of interesting things. So if we launch this, so this is the new version, right? So if we launch this, you can see some interesting timers. 
Uh, first of all, the frame rate in general is higher, right? And if I make this like tiny, kind of like I did before, let me just try and make it like roughly the same size, which will be difficult, just to kind of reduce that GPU usage. You can see we're like comfortably above 500 FPS here. And we have some interesting stats here as well. So let me just spawn in like some more, you know, bodies, try and make it kind of fair so it's about the same amount. All right, let's grab a screenshot. And to make this super clear, we have old and we have new. So if we take a look at these stats, so first of all, like, right, like clear performance improvement. And by the way, when you're down to this level, meaning like these are both running very fast, right? Like we're above 300 FPS and obviously like the resolution is small, but if we increase the resolution, it's obviously not gonna increase the CPU usage, just like the GPU usage. So we are in like kind of like a very fast territory here. The amount that you're gonna see like increase is obviously going to be smaller like to double the fps to go from like 330 to 660 like you're really kind of going from like 3.34 milliseconds to like i don't know 1.6 or 1.7 which is very difficult to do because you're in that kind of millisecond range like it's obviously hard to process and render this entire game in such a fast frame rate but you can see the new hazel is actually able to do that this is substantially faster the gpu time is also a little bit faster and there are reasons for that it's because i've cut out some of the render passes that weren't even used in this version but shipped anyway like stuff that was kind of in use by the editor but you can see the render thread is also much, much, much faster. And in fact, what's cool here is that we actually have a breakdown of what the render thread is doing. So the CPU only time here is 0 0.98 milliseconds. That's really important to note because what that does is it cuts out any time we spend waiting for the GPU. So you can see the GPU took 1.95 milliseconds. We spent about 0.8 milliseconds waiting for the GPU because we couldn't progress further. So that's what kind of builds up that 1.77 milliseconds. But really the render thread itself, the CPU time of just the render thread operations that it had to do was around one millisecond. And then it also spent about half a millisecond waiting for the main thread. Cause you can see the main thread for this like particular frame for whatever reason is taking up more time than the render thread. And obviously the main thread is not waiting for the render thread because it's taking longer. And by the way, if you're interested in this kind of main thread, render thread kind of thing, I did make a video talking about multi-threading in Hazel. That was actually the first devlog. So I'll have that linked up there. You can take a look at that on the first episode of the devlog series, not like the first devlog ever for Hazel. And if people want more depth, then I did mention I'm trying to do that on Patreon now. So like leave a comment there. But that 0 0.98 milliseconds is basically all the all the work that's been submitted to the render command queue, which a lot of it is just like Vulkan commands. So like stuff like recording Vulkan command buffers, that's what's there, right? So that's the kind of stuff we're doing there. And obviously in the old version, it was still doing that stuff, but it was also doing like, you know, allocating descriptor sets and doing like updating descriptor sets, doing all of this extra CPU work, not to mention the Hazel side of like gathering information about materials and all the buffers and textures and resources it used. All of that stuff was happening every frame. It's now no longer happening unless it needs to. So because something's changed and the result is something much, much faster. Now this game is fairly light in terms of CPU usage, which is again, why it's difficult to demonstrate this. We just haven't made a particularly heavy game. And this, obviously these numbers are on this like QA machine. It's on, what do we call it? Poppy. It's not on like some, it's not on my like development rig, which is way more powerful. This is like the Steam hardware survey PC. So yeah, that's uh, what we've been up to. I actually kind of started this journey back in October, I think, October or November. So it has definitely been a long time. I haven't spent that much time on it, but I would say it probably did take me at least a solid four weeks of work. Like if I had to add up all the bits here and there that I've actually spent working on this new renderer, I would say at least four weeks, four to six weeks maybe even. So it definitely has been like a lot of work, but I'm very excited that we've finally done this because this doesn't even really demonstrate the difference too well. I'm really looking forward to seeing some of those stress tests because I know that like, you know, the more objects you have, the more materials you have, it kind of increases, that cost will just increase kind of linearly, if not even probably a bit more than linearly. Whereas with this new system, it just scales a lot better. Like you can have so many more objects, so many more materials, and you won't even really feel that cost too much, which is obviously really cool. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Studio Cherno is doing a game jam at the end of this month. We're doing Lotum Dare 53, I think it is. And we'll be using this new renderer obviously for that, which is, I'm super excited that I actually could finish this in time because I was getting slightly stressed. We'll all be live streaming that game jam 
for the entire three days. So make sure you catch us there. If you have any questions about this new render or you want to see more kind of Vulcan rendery related videos, then definitely let me know in the comment section below. Don't forget to check out brilliant.org slash as well, and I will see you next time. Goodbye.